Good morning. Welcome to Waypoint. So glad you're here this morning. As we're heading into summer, it's just good to be together again. Uh, I want to tell you, we had a great time yesterday at the I Am 24-7 Cornhole Tournament. And I won't say who won because I actually don't know who won, but don't ever play cornhole against Andrew Bender and Will Moore. I'm just going to tell you that <laughs> straight up. Wow. That was incredible. Um, I had a great, great weekend. I hope you all did. Uh, just great to be together again. I uh, want to let you know that coming up in the fall, we're going to have some small group opportunities. We don't try to start things really during the summer. But if you're looking for a place to connect a little deeper, go uh, get to know some more people, we've got some opportunities coming up. Uh, one is the couple study. to be a young couple study that several folks have expressed interest in doing. And uh, Sandy and Betsy Weathersby are going to kind of organize and help head that up. And many other couples have expressed interest in that. Probably we'll have a couple of gatherings this summer and then uh, look to the fall to kind of have more of a regular uh, meeting space. And then as always on Fridays, the Waypoint Expedition is a Zoom. If you uh, can't get away during the week and you want to just jump on for an hour on Fridays, we'd love to have you join uh, 12 to 1 on, on uh, those Fridays. I uh, wanted to also, if you've read the Wednesday email or if you read the email announcement that Wes sent out, you've seen uh, this uh, picture right here. So we could not be more excited. We've been praying about a uh, new youth director for quite some time. But so Noah Satterfield is coming on board at Waypoint. He's going to be a uh, youth director at Waypoint, also a Young Life Church partner. So it's kind of this partnership between Waypoint and Young Life uh, ministry, if you don't know, to high school kids. Uh, it's a great situation for us. Uh, Noah is just a, a super guy. He actually is working. Uh, he's, it's funny, I got a phone call from a woman that uh, was in our wedding, uh, a good friend of Emma and mine, and uh, she called me, Holly called me and said, I hear you guys were talking to this Noah guy, and she said, man, she's at a church in the north, and she said, if we could hire him right now, we would, but we just can't, and uh, so we're really excited to have Noah, and um, it just could not be more excited. He and Emily are getting married on June 18th, uh, they've been dating for a while, getting married on June 18th. And then starting August 1st, he will be here at Waypoint commuting uh, and, and spending time with middle and high school kids and just kind of building uh, relationships and building a program for the youth ministry. But then they are going to move full time here in January of 2023, which is why that slide looks the way it's. He's moving to Charlotte. She's in med school and will be in Winston-Salem until January. So we could not be more excited. Uh, he'll be here probably once or twice between now and then. But just wanted to let you guys know that that was coming. With that in mind, let's stand up and worship and thank you, Mr. Lord. So like Chip said, um, if you weren't here when he first said it, the, the gathering yesterday um, of Cornhole, to have an interaction with you guys, it's tough for us to all know each other um, by just showing up on Sunday. And, and life happens, lots of life happens outside of Sunday. So I encourage everyone to, uh, to find that, to meet each other, greet each other. Um, if you don't already know somebody sitting next to you to, before the end of the day, then you know them. Um, so yeah, you guys can sing with this church. Yeah. 
just a, a while ago said it still kind of feels new to the church and stuff. It's called Known by Love. Continue in Matthew today to talk about um, actually the calling of Matthew. Each of these songs, uh, have, how they resonate with me, is um, and how I was called, how I heard God's voice in my life. Um, each, 
each of us that happens to. That's why we're here. Whether you heard it through a friend, whether you heard it in just a whisper, you heard it in your heart, you just wanted life to be different. You wanted a, a savior. You wanted to uh, release control of your life to something that's so much better. And uh, in my faith walk, um, things like, Lord, I need you. Everything and nothing less, and I surrender are so important because the more of me there is in here, the less of him there is. Um, so, and I, I want to be known by love, and I want to give everything and nothing less. So, we're going to sing that together.
again. I've been, uh, as many of you know, I've been reading this book called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. And it has been rocking my world. And I think if there was one word I could say that uh, sums up the book and the effect it's had on my heart and my mind, it's surrender. And just letting go of some things and letting God have it. Uh, letting go of control. And it's been this beautiful journey. Um, you know, we come to this part of the service, and um, this is the part in, in our service when often we'll do, do a confession. And so what we'll do together is say this prayer. Uh, I want to say it together, and then we'll invite you just to take you know, 20, 30 seconds in silent confession between you and the Lord, uh, just for yourself, and to just be with the Lord. And be, in those moments, just surrender whatever you're holding on to. And let go of that. And then after that, we'll, uh, I'll close this up with a prayer after that. So let's say this prayer together uh, as we come to this place in the service and this place in our hearts and our heads. And just so you know, Abba, so Abba is uh, this, this um, just intimate word for father in, in, uh, in Hebrew. And so it's this beautiful sense when Jesus uh, prays the Lord's Prayer, it's, it's, the sense there is Abba, Father. And that's why we, we say this here. So Abba, Father. We confess that we form judgments about others without knowing what you know. We even judge ourselves and evaluate our standing with you based on worldly influences rather than your heart for us. Hear now, Lord, as we bring our personal confessions to you. Help us surrender everything and nothing less. In Jesus' name. to you and we ask you, Lord, to help us see the places where we are holding on to too much of us and not letting go so that we would have more of you. We thank you that you're the kind of God and that you're the kind of Abba that we can trust and that invites us into this space just as we are, but that you love us to let us stay that way. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Uh, this is, at this point in service, we, we're going to uh, have the offering that Eric and Luke are going to lead us in song. Just want to remind you and invite you, if you're uh, here at Waypoint for the first time or don't really feel like you're connected, please feel zero pressure to contribute to the offering here. This is really for folks who kind of call Waypoint home and uh, feel connected and want to uh, desire to do to just be a part of that sacrifice. But uh, please hear me that if you're here just visiting with us, we're glad you're here. And uh, this is just our gift to you, and, and your gift to us is just to be here. So thank you for being here. And, uh, we passed the baskets. We don't really have ushers during the offering, so we're just going to ask you if you're on the second row to grab the basket and just pass it till it gets to the back, and uh, then we'll, we'll get them and collect them. But uh, just glad you're here. Enjoy this part. <laughs>
Everybody could bow their heads and pray for us. So Lord Jesus, in your name there's power. Holy Spirit, just make us, make us bold. Bold enough to shine for you, Lord. Outside of this uh, safe place, outside of these church walls. Yeah, let us be in awe of you and not to, to sin despite our circumstances. And give us strength to give up something that is comfortable but keeping us apart from you, Lord Jesus. Your peace is enough to silence our worries. To give us your courage enough to speak up against the things that are not okay. Lord, in your strength, enable us to bring all that we are and all that we are not. And know that it's exactly So last week, I had the privilege of hiking along the AT with Mark and a couple of other guys. We were out spending three days on the AT, camping out each night, and it was just a really refreshing week away. It was partly because I had no cell service, and so I was able to be totally disconnected from kind of the broader world. Quite frankly, as we spent each day, all that mattered was getting to the next water stop or where we were going to camp that night. It was really ref refreshing because of that simplicity. And, and it struck me as we would kind of break down camp and stuff all of our things into our bags and carry our packs through the woods, how freeing it was as well. Because it, it struck me that we were carrying on our backs literally everything we needed to survive. That, that we were able to shoulder and hold on to the things we needed to get through that day. A, a shelter, food, water, whatever we needed for that day was on our backs. And I realized the simplicity of that and came back into life in South Charlotte and realized how complex we make everything. And, and when I saw in Scripture, if you notice in Scripture, God is often calling men out of the complexity of life into the simplicity of the wilderness. You got the story of Abraham in Genesis 12. God tells him to pack up all of his belongings and take his family out of the city of Ur and out to trust him, to depend on him day after day. You've got Moses who was born into the Pharaoh's palace, having everything at his fingertips, who's called by God to leave the palace and to go out into the desert. You've got David who has that experience. You've got Jonah. You've got Paul, Elijah. Story after story of people who are called away from the complexity of life to simply trusting God day after day after day to depend on him. In Exodus, we hear the story of the people of Israel are wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. But every day, God provides the food they need to get through that day. The sense of daily dependence on him. And so as we were hiking through the mountains, I just realized how simple life can be when we have what we need on our backs, when we have the trust in God, our dependence in the Lord that way. If we were to pack up everything and to follow him and trust him. And it reminded me, 20 years ago this week, I graduated from Davidson College. This kind of season, I was graduating from college. I was engaged to Lindsay already by that point. We we're going to get married in September. But I remember the day of graduation. The day of graduation, that very next day, I had a job interview. And so I remember that while all my other friends were kind of waking up after all the graduation parties, a little groggy, a little slower, I had to wear my suit. And I had packed my car full of all my belongings. I mean, my car was absolutely packed full of everything. It looked kind of like this. Not quite, but, but kind of like that. My car was so full of things that as I got in my nice suit, I was very careful because I could barely move the gear shift. And so I was driving down into Charlotte, into a church here in town, 
to interview for their middle school youth director position. And I was absolutely convinced I was going to get this job. As I drove down there in my nice suit, I, I knew I was qualified, and this was the job God was calling me to. Lindsay was going into grad school here in Charlotte, so we knew we were going to be living here in town, and I knew this was my job. So much so that I also realized there was only one other candidate for the job who was a neighbor of mine in college, and so I knew I was far more qualified than this person. I was convinced as I drove down there and I sat in the interview and I knocked that interview out of the park. I wowed them. It was amazing. And, and so I drove back to our apartment we were going to be renting in Charlotte. I was so convinced I had this job. I'd already signed a lease on an apartment within a nice commuting time to this church. So I knew it was my job. And I waited for the offer to come. They didn't call me immediately. I waited another day, another day, another day. Twelve days later, I decide I better call and check in on what happened on that offer. And, and so I call the head of the interview team, and she's like, oh, oh, I'm so sorry. We, we forgot to tell you. We went with the other candidate instead of you. And, and I remember that day where I was convinced this is what God wanted in my life, and I was utterly devastated. No, I was getting married in four months. No other job offers out there. I, I quickly jumped in my car and I drove around Charlotte to get applications for the only other career I ever had, which was waiting tables. So I went to Mimosa Grill and to Harper's and got the job applications and started filling those out. I remember falling asleep on my mattress in this apartment that was on the floor because I didn't have any other furniture. And, and waking up the next morning, utterly convinced that God wanted me to be doing youth ministry, not waiting tables. So I got online and started Googling some churches in town and got onto a phone and called a church down in South Charlotte to see if the youth director needed an assistant because I just I needed a job. Uh, I'd be happy to make photocopies, whatever they might need. And I remember getting on the phone and calling this young lady, and she just said, oh, it's really interesting you called me today. Because yesterday I announced to my church that I would be leaving. And so why don't you come down next Sunday and let's have an interview. I'll set up an interview for you with this position. And that church was Providence Presbyterian. It's where I met Keith Gershio. It's where I met Ann Hilborn, Pete's and Libby Geis. The, these families that have helped to grow Waypoint into the church that it is. And so as I'm heading off into sabbatical in 14 days, not that I'm counting, but, but as I get ready to leave, I've just been reflecting on what God's been doing in and through our lives. 20 years ago, when I was convinced that I was supposed to take that other church job, God had something greater in store for me, but he first needed to humble me and, and to crush me in order to show me what he had in store for me. And so my question for you today is we're going to look at the story of Matthew. And my question for you is what does God want to invite you to come and to trust in him? How might you be sitting in that 12-day waiting period wondering what God is up to? Or are you just wondering, God, where are you? What are you doing? And what would it look like to trust him, to follow him, not to have God try to answer all of your plans and desires, but what would it look like if you began to follow his plans for your life? So if you've got your Bibles with you, I'd invite you to open up. We're going to look at Matthew 9. You're welcome to uh, flash and grab the scriptures off of the screen with this. But we're going to look at the story of Matthew. He's this young man who actually comes to write the entire gospel story we're reading. And so this is a story how he becomes a follower of Jesus Christ. So as we turn to God's word, let me just turn to God in prayer for us. Father, Abba, uh, God, I, I pray that you would speak to our hearts, whatever we need to hear this day, Lord, that you would speak louder than I would, that you would silence my heart, you would bring your word alive to each one of us so that we might be able to hear you and to know what you are wanting to speak to us. Lord, we pray this in your son's name. Amen. So Matthew 9, starting with the ninth verse. Jesus is in his hometown, Capernaum. 
And, and as Jesus is walking along, it says, as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at a tax booth. Now, Luke, when he's telling this story, and Mark, when they're describing this story, they say that Matthew's name is Levi. And, and possibly one of the reasons that his name is Levi is he might be part of the Levi tradition, the Levi tribe. And, and if that's true, then what that means is Matthew was part of the priestly tribe, the religious important people of that time period. And so this picture of this man that Jesus comes across is this man named Matthew, who's part of the Levite tribe, that he had great potential to be a priestly leader of their community, to rise up and be a prominent leader of that. Yet for some reason, he's become a tax collector. And as we'll see later, a tax collector was kind of a despised position. And so in that, I see this tension in young Matthew's life. He was a Levite. He had potential, but yet he decided to squander it and pursue this position as a tax collector. So Jesus saw this young man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. The great invitation, come, follow me. And Matthew rose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. Now when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when Jesus heard it, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what it means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Can you picture that home, that, that dinner party that's going on there? Matthew with his tax collectors and sinful friends are hanging out. When the Pharisees are kind of standing in judgment, saying to Jesus, why, why would you associate with these people? What, what benefit would they bring to you? Why, why are you hanging out with them? And he says to them, he's quoting Hosea 6.6 6 there. And he's saying, understand this, that I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Uh, I desire mercy. Loving kindness. I, I desire mercy, compassion, not sacrifice. He, he's telling the Pharisees, I, I desire your hearts, not just you going through the religious motion." The Pharisees would have been people who had followed up to over 600 laws and rules and rituals that were just going through the motion. That a dinner party with a Pharisee would have been kind of that super formal dinner party. As you came into the house, the Pharisee's house, if you were to have dinner, you would have only been invited if you had kind of been qualified. If you had certain prestige, wealth, power. And then you would have had your table seat assigned to you based on how important you were. The Pharisees had very much rituals and rules to how they would sit. So much so that they would start to overcomplicate the dinner table as well. I, I was reading through some of the old rules that to dine with a Pharisee, what it would mean. And, and there's this book called the Mishnah, these rules uh, which would describe all the ways they had to live it out. And one of the rules was that if the food was wild caught then you had to actually eat it with dirty hands. But if it was clean food, you, gotta, you had to eat it with clean, food, uh, clean hands. And so they would very specifically kind of micromanage the way the whole entire meal would go. Think of those kind of formal dining things when you're not quite sure what fork you're supposed to use, when and, and where. That's what hanging out at a Pharisee's house would have been like. It went on and described it. It said, if someone had said to you, give me this loaf to eat or that wine to drink, pointing at it on the table, but they were not of a certain status, then you couldn't give them that specific food or, or wine they drink, even though it was on the table. There was kind of a lot of, of ritual and, and rules to it. And so when Jesus is saying, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, he's saying, I desire your heart, your compassion, your love, not this dry ritual, just going through the motions of it. See, Jesus, I picture that room filled with all the tax collectors and sinners would have been a whole lot more fun than hanging out with the Pharisees. Like, it would have been a fun dinner party. 
sitting around that way. The life stories that would have come out uh, of folks. If you were here when we were back preaching about the Sermon on the Mount, and we saw in Matthew 6 how Jesus said that one line, judge not lest ye be judged. Uh, To me, this story is now the kind of practical application of living that out. The Pharisees were standing there in judgment over everybody else. Missing the party. Missing the fun. And I saw this quote this week that I really appreciated. It said, it's the human condition to judge everything and to compare ourselves to others. But doing so leads to deluded thinking that either you're superior to everyone or inferior, inadequate. Think about that. We naturally judge a situation when we walk into it. That just is naturally how we are hardwired. But every time we judge someone, we're either going to feel superior, better than them, as the Pharisees felt about that room full of tax collectors and sinners, or we're going to feel inadequate, out of place, we don't fit. You never sit in judgment and then kind of feel like, yeah, I'm good, I'm good enough here. You either feel superior or inadequate. And Jesus in that table and around that room is he's drawing together the people, the people who are hungry, who realize, as he said, who realize they're not healthy, but they're sick, that are willing to admit they're sick. See, the church, the church community is supposed to be a hospital ward where we realize we're sick and in need of a Savior. It's not supposed to be some formal dining room party where if you just say the right things and go through the right motions, you're okay. Rather, it's the sick who realize they need help. They, they need a Savior, someone to rescue them. Jesus says, I came to call not the righteous, not the ones who are doing all the right things, but the sinners, those like me, like you, who keep stumbling and bumbling through life. Because uh, us sinful folks, we realize we have nothing to give the Lord. But we can give him everything, our hearts, our whole lives. We can surrender over to him. And so Jesus came not to call the righteous, not to call those who've got life figured out, but to call those of us who are wondering, those of us who are in those 12-day waiting periods, wondering, what, what is God up to? What are, are you doing? Where are you? Those are the people God is coming to call. That's who Matthew was. Ma- Matthew was a young man. Remember, again, if he was a Levite, part of the Levite tradition, he, he would have been a man who had great opportunity ahead of him, who squandered it by falling and becoming a tax collector. You see, a tax collector of that time period was hated by everyone. Think about uh, if a tax collector showed up at your home today, your place of business, how excited would you be to see them? If you've ever seen Stranger Than Fiction, it reminds me of this scene when, once again, for some reason I have two Will Ferrell nods here, but Will Ferrell shows up as a tax collector to this woman's place of business. You miscreants. I understand. Somewhere else we could talk about this? Uh, no. <laughs> We're going to talk about this right here. Okay. So. See, Matthew, as a tax collector, that would have been his daily experience, being rejected by people. You see, a tax collector in this time period in Capernaum, he would have been a man of Jewish descent working for the Roman government. So everybody hated him. The Jewish community, his family, his friends hated him because he had sold out and was working for the government, working for the Romans who were oppressing him, calling upon them and telling them how much they owed. And the Romans would have despised him because he was of Jewish descent. He was of an inferior race. So Matthew was absolutely a man who felt like an outsider as a misfit as if he didn't belong, that any time he walked into a place, he would have been booed and and hissed. And so one day, he's sitting there at his tax booth, 
doing his daily grind when, when this man shows up and does a simple invitation of follow me. And it says Matthew stood up and began to follow him. That, that there was something in that invitation by Jesus, as simple it was, to follow me. Matthew had never been invited anywhere to a party, never been invited to hang out with anybody, for he was rejected as an outsider, as a misfit. And suddenly, this one man shows up and says, come, come follow me. I want to spend time with you. I want to hang out with you. And that one man was the God of the universe, that Jesus Christ came into this world to show us how much he loves us. That when we feel like an outsider, we feel like a misfit, he shows up and says, come, come and, and follow me. See, the beautiful thing of the gospel is we get to call Jesus our friend. John 15, 15 says it well, where Jesus says, now you are my friends, since I've told you everything the Father told me. Since I told you the story and the love of God for you, you are now my friends verse before that, he says, you're no longer my servants, but my friends. We have a friend who is God. That if you feel alone, neglected, ignored, nobody cares about you, no, nobody even will show, know that you have a God who is your friend, a, a God who loves you. For Matthew, hearing that invitation, follow me, it changed his whole life's trajectory. Because immediately he got up from that tax booth and he began to follow Jesus. And what he did was he had, took with him his pen. If you think about it, G Matthew's old job was to write down the debts that you owed the government. He would keep a kind of ledger of what people owed. But once he found Jesus Christ and began to follow him, he picked up that same pen to start telling us the gospel story of a God who loved us of a God who paid all of our debts, that he suddenly discovered in Jesus Christ his friend was the one who could bring us hope and healing and restoration if we would just begin to follow him. And notice what he does immediately after that. He picks up his pen, begins to follow Jesus, and then they end up in Matthew's home where they're having a big old party filled with tax collectors and sinners people who had never been included or invited before. Matthew opens up his home so that they might meet who Jesus Christ is as well. See, the beautiful part of Matthew's story is followership immediately leads into leadership. As Matthew begins to follow Jesus, he immediately also begins to invite friends to come along and to follow him following Jesus. And then that house just gets filled with misfits with great stories, fun, energy, passion, love, mercy, where, where suddenly all the people who felt like outsiders suddenly feel like they belong. You see, Jesus associated himself with the unsavory types, those who lived beyond the edge of respectable society, who offered no social advantage. But God so humbled himself that he entered this world as Jesus Christ, to come and to find those of us who are sick, those of us who are in need, who have no social advantage, who are able to just stand in the presence of a God who loved us, a God who saves us, a God who redeems us, and a God who then frees us up to go into the places of our city, to the people who are unsavory and on the edges of respectable society, and maybe, maybe bring them a little hope as well. I love when we were worshiping in, back in Myers Park High School days, six, seven years ago. There's a man who would worship with us who's a rather prominent, respected man in our community. And, and he came up to me, and he had this great line. He goes, Wes, Wes, what I appreciate about Waypoint is Waypoint, all the other churches in kind of this, this area and along this kind of corridor, all the other churches, you can kind of line up church attendance with country club membership. But the thing I like about Waypoint is there's no social capital to be here. And I love that vision for us. We're, we're not here to just go through the motions like the Pharisees. We're here because we realize we're in need of a Savior. That we're misfits and outsiders who are hungry, hungry 
for something more, for the invitation of Jesus to come and to follow me. Thanks be to God. Amen. So that's why we, we have this time at Waypoint that we call praise and prayer. Praise and prayer, if you're visiting with us, has always been kind of the cornerstone moment uh, of the worship service. As I've heard some of y'all talk,